We are starting one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. We're starting the book of James. And so if you have your Bibles, would you open up to James chapter one? And as you start this study with us today, uh, I wanna make sure that you really ask the Lord to reveal himself to you, to speak to you. And it should be something that is a regular habit as you open the word of God, that you would preface your study in the word of God by asking him to reveal himself to you, to show you something from his word, to reveal himself to you. And if you ask the Lord to reveal himself, you will find that your life will be forever changed. You will change. The Lord will have his work accomplished in your life. And what we're going to be studying in the book of James are not just merely suggestions, uh, nor good ideas, uh, but rather the laying out of the dimensions for God's plan for your life. And so I wonder if you realize today, do you realize today that God has a master plan for your life? See, often you'll see and maybe you've attended a master class or maybe you've even given one uh, on a subject or in a specific field. See, God has given you the master plan for how you might be everything that he has created and designed you to be. And those master plans are found in God's word. And it's not just the master plan, but it's the master's plan for you. And as you look through the word of God and as you explore it, as you study it, as you apply it, as you hold your current life next to the goals and aspirations of the godly man or woman found or that they should have in the word of God, where do you stack up? In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And then Colossians 2, 8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. The book of James that we're starting today will not be dealing with opinion, tradition, worldly philosophy, or self-help. And this is very important to note because there are so many worldly principles and philosophies that are creeping inside the church and it is deceiving and ripping off the follower of Jesus. Paul even goes as far to say as you are being cheated if you accept the philosophies of the world as the teachings of God. And so we'll be given the measurements for how we are to build out our Christian life and we'll also see the guesswork removed. You're not gonna be wondering, well, I hope I get it right. Well, you know, I'm just gonna kind of, you know, give a shot in the dark and maybe I'll be like Jesus and do the right thing. Uh, this book's gonna deal with prejudices. It's gonna deal with money. It's gonna deal with our communication, our tongue, how we speak. It's gonna deal with faith, with and without works, wisdom, patience, humility, submitting to God, resisting the devil, and so much more. You know, Warren Wiersbe, who's one of my favorite authors, said this, and I quote, not everyone who grows old grows up. There is a vast difference between age and maturity. There are more problems caused by immaturity by than anything else. If Christians would just grow up, they would become victors instead of victims, end of quote. And so to set the goal for what we're about to embark upon today, I'd like to paraphrase J.B. Phillips where he said, may we find that we have become men and women of mature character with no weak spots. So let's pray. Father, as we get into your word today, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say. Lord, I ask that we would, by your spirit, mature and grow into those men and women that you have created and designed and called us to be. I ask that you would help us, Lord, 
as we look to your word, that we would give an honest, spirit-led evaluation of where we stand in light of your holiness. And I ask that we would not be hearers only, but doers also. And so, Lord, today, would you have your hand upon your church? Would you move by your Holy Spirit? And, Lord, we commit now the reading and study of your word to you and ask that you would add your blessing to it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. So let's begin where all good books begin, at the beginning. In James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, Greetings. Now, if you've studied the Bible, you would have come across four different men named James. James, the son of Zebedee, that's John's brother. James, the son of Alphaeus. You would have James also, the father of Judas, not Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. And I can only picture this James, who had a son named Judas, saying, No, 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 not that Judas, a different Judas. Uh, that would be the third James. And then fourthly, James, the half-brother of Jesus. So this is the James that authored this letter, Jesus' half-brother. So you remember, that which was conceived in Mary was of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus was born of a virgin. We know that to be true from God's word, but Mary did marry Joseph, and they had other children after Jesus was born, and James was one of those other children. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 57, if you like to turn there, you can. I'll read it for you. It says, when Jesus had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not, is not his mother Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And so they were offended at him. It was actually a comment that was a, Derision. Who in the world do you think you are? We know, aren't you the carpenter's son? We know your mom, Mary. We know your family. We know, we've known you since you were little. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. That those that were closest to him because they were familiar with him, familiar with him, were the ones that were rejecting him. See, here in Matthew, we have a partial list of the names of Jesus. And again, that's Matthew 13. It's at the end of that chapter, verses 54 through 57. We have a partial list of the names of Jesus' half-brothers and sisters. So James, the author of this letter, is the half-brother of Jesus. And Jesus said that a prophet was not without honor except in his own country and his own house. So think about this for a moment. Could you imagine growing up with Jesus as your older brother? Imagine that. I mean, that takes, can't you be more like your older brother to a whole different level? It's like, come on, seriously? See, James did not, believe this or not, he did not grow up believing that Jesus was the Messiah. He was raised in the same home. He no doubt heard the same stories of Jesus' birth, but he did not believe. And there comes a point in every person's life, even those raised in a Christian home, where you have to decide if you believe in Jesus. You can have brothers and sisters in the same house, raised by the same parents, went to church the same amount of time, heard the same Bible stories, etc. Each one has to determine, each of us have to determine what we believe today. In John chapter 7, and I love this because we get a comprehensive view of the scriptures. In John 7, verses 3 through 7, it says, Jesus' brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea. 
that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. And then they kind of had this little snide remark. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then John says in verse 5, For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. His own brothers didn't believe. But then not only that, the retort or the response from Jesus to his brothers was Jesus actually lumps his brothers together with the world. Those that he grew up in his own house with. He said, the world cannot hate you. We know that the world does not hate its own. The world hated Jesus because Jesus exposed its evil works. And because James, let's just put it on the personal level, because James was of the world, the world accepted him. And the same thing goes today. And we often try to find that acceptance in the world. But if you're truly a follower of Jesus, you will find that the world will not accept you because of what you believe. And it's not you that they're rejecting, it's Jesus in you that they will not receive. And for this reason, Jesus told James that the world cannot hate you, but that it hates him because Jesus exposes that the world's works, he testifies that the world's works are evil. And the world doesn't like that. We don't want to have any conviction. We don't want to have anyone telling us that what we're doing is wrong or evil. See, apart from Christ, we don't want that either. We don't want somebody telling us what we're doing is wrong. Like, who do you think you are? But the moment you feel and receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you realize, hey, what I'm doing is actually against God. It's called sin, and it leads to death. And I have one of two options. I'll either reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit or I'll receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I'll repent and turn from my sin. And so it begs the question, if James grows up as a part of the world, Jesus even lumps him in with those that are evil and that hate him. What happened to James? What happened to him? It's like people that know me from my past and they hop on social media and they'd be like, you're a what now? You pastor, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus and they start laughing. Yeah, right, come on, man. You'd be the last person in the world that would ever follow Jesus. It's James. How do you go from being of the world to not of the world? James saw Jesus crucified, but his life was changed when he saw Jesus resurrected. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, I hope you're taking notes because you will have a very, very good foundation for understanding this letter by understanding the history behind it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says that after Jesus rose from the dead, that he was seen by other people people. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says that the resurrected Jesus was seen by James, that's his half-brother, and all the apostles. And so what happened was that James saw Jesus in a completely different way. And then you fast forward to just after the ascension of Jesus, and just before, so this little middle of the, uh, this little a uh, place between some major events. Jesus ascends to heaven and then the birth of the church. You find James praying, waiting on the Lord. In Acts chapter one, verse 14, it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Jesus' brothers ended up believing in him and were a part of what would become the early church. His brothers came to faith. 
And then Jesus' brothers' lives were actually used for the establishment of the church. For James became the head of the church in the city of Jerusalem. This is the man whose name is attached to this letter. So James, who did not believe in Jesus, became an influential leader in the church, and even Paul the Apostle referred to James in Galatians 2.9 as being a pillar of the church. How's that for an endorsement? Paul the Apostle says, yep, that's my man right there. That guy, great leader. And so James, he ran the first ever recorded church conference. Before we had our conferences, James had the first one in Acts chapter 15. James was the first person contacted by Peter when Peter was delivered from prison in Acts 12. James was also the one to whom Paul brought greetings and a special financial gift to help support the work that James was doing in the city of Jerusalem. And so, when you read verse 1 again, of what is referred to as the first of the general epistles, I think we read it in a completely different light now. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So now you say, oh, that's James. This is who he is. If you look here in the first one, It says he's a bondservant of God. In the Greek language, this is a word that we would phonetically pronounce in English as doulos. So James doesn't open up this letter and say, yeah, I am the brother of Jesus. You might know me. He says, I am James, the bondservant of Jesus Christ, which means slave by choice. Means that he chose to follow the Lord. It means that he had other options of what he could do with his life. And he personally made the decision to say, I am going to follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's why we live our lives for the glory of the Lord. James had a life-changing experience with the resurrected Messiah. And James became that man that glorified the Lord as he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He became a slave by choice, that bondservant, the doulos of Christ. Now, how many of you here today have children? I mean, parents in the house. Wow, there's a lot of you. Struggle is real, isn't it? But how many of you as parents ever wondered if your kids are actually hearing anything that you have to say? How about this? How many of you parents have ever wondered how many of your children, how much of what you're saying about the Lord to your children is actually making any kind of impact? Or is it just going in one ear and out the other? You know, I wonder that as a dad. You know, even as a pastor, some people think, well, your kids have to be perfect, and that's not true. My kids are normal kids, just like everybody else's kids. Just like I'm just like you, like everybody else is. And I wonder often, are they understanding it? Are they getting it? Because eventually you want your children to be raised in such a way that when they're old, they won't depart from it. As the scriptures say, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, John, In his little epistle said, I have no greater joy than to see that my children walk in the truth. And so it can be a real, real hard thing to work through this. Like, are they understanding it? But then they have to make their own decisions. They need to be their own man, their own woman. And Lord, please. Isaiah 55, verse 11, really spoke to me. And I think of Mary and Joseph as parents, not only of the Messiah, but of other children that they were raising unto the Lord. 
Mary and Joseph believed in who Jesus was, but their children did not initially. But Isaiah 55, verse 11, the Lord says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And if you've ever heard in church circles, someone say something to the effect, hey brother, God's word never returns void. Well, this is where they get that from. It's Isaiah 55, 11. And what this means is that God's word, when it is spoken, when it is read, will never not do anything. See, the seeds of the truth of God's word are implanted in your life and in your children's lives. And as they're in Sunday school or they're praying with you before bed or you're reading the Bible together and you're wondering if they'll ever understand it, the word of God never returns void. Mary and Joseph must have been thinking the same thing that we think. What about my other kids? And it's so hard if I maybe have one child that's walking with the Lord and another that is not. They were raised in the same home and heard the same things and had the same opportunity. But do not ever forget that the word of God is living and every single seed of truth that was implanted in their lives is there and will accomplish exactly what God set forth for it to accomplish. For this reason, I believe that James writes in verse 21, if you would jump down there of chapter one, he says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Do you start to maybe have an understanding of James' perspective increasing right now? Lay aside sin. Lay aside the filth of this world. Receive the implanted word. Do not reject it. Get rid of all the filthiness of sin so it won't overflow out of your life. Remember, Jesus looked at him and said, you're of the world. And the world cannot hate you. I wonder if that was convicting to him or if it it hardened his heart. I wonder if that was something that stayed with him for a long time, that resonated with him as he was going through this season of, I'm not believing. But it would appear that though James was not a believer during Jesus' earthly ministry, that he did actually hear the words that Jesus spoke. There are numerous allusions and correlations with the sermon on the amount that Jesus gave that James includes in his letter. And this blew me away. Because so often you'll cast the, you know, the seed out there and throw it out there far and wide. And some may look like they have no clue what you're talking about. Some may be nodding. Yes, that's great. Others may be sleeping. I'm sorry, I'll try to do better next time. I mean, what do you do? You don't know. And the same thing applies with our relationships interpersonally, with our own family, with our friends, our children. I truly believe that because the word of God is living and because it never returns void, that it will always always do what it's supposed to do. And we see this because James who didn't believe in Jesus in verse 2, we'll write something that correlates with Matthew 5, 10 through 12. And James 1, 4, it correlates with Matthew 5, 48. We'll get there next week. James 1, 5, it goes right in line with Matthew 7, 7 through 12. James 1, 22, 7, 21 through 27 of Matthew. Same section of Jesus' teaching. James 4, 11, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. James 5, 1 through 3, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. And it goes on and on and on. And so all of a sudden, the light bulb came on where it was like, 
James was listening. And even when he didn't think that he knew those things, the Holy Spirit was working in his heart through the living word of God that was implanted in his life. And so when you spend time reading and praying and investing in spiritual things and you're wondering if they're ever going to get it, believe me, the Lord is moving. And James is living proof. I even remember my own brother. We have walked away from the Lord for a long time. And when he came to the place of surrendering his life to Jesus, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit and he looked at me with wide eyes and he said, I had no idea I even knew any of these verses that I've memorized. Because the Holy Spirit made it alive. Instantly, when there's that surrender to the Holy Spirit and that faith that's placed in the Lord, everything that has been planted and watered and invested brings forth life. Because the word of God never returns void. And it's amazing to know that. And so James, he would be considered a Messianic Jew. He was raised as a Jew, but he found salvation through faith in Jesus. And, air quote, coincidentally enough, he'd be the perfect guy to lead the new church in Jerusalem, which would be a bunch of Jews who have gotten saved. And so he writes to the 12 tribes of Israel, if you look at the end of verse one, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. These were the Christian Jews that were outside the land referred to as Palestine. But if you remember, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, when the spirit of God descended upon those that were waiting on the Lord, that all those Jews who had traveled to Jerusalem from nations far and wide, who spoke in different languages outside of the language of Jerusalem, they heard something remarkable. They even thought these guys were drunk when the Holy Spirit came upon them because they're praising God in languages that were not their native tongue. And Peter gets up and he says, no, these guys are not drunk, but this is actually a fulfillment of the prophet, which said that the Holy Spirit would come upon. And they began praising the name of the Lord in other languages so that those Jews that had traveled from those other na nations, which spoke those languages, were absolutely blown away. And they heard a message after that by Peter and thousands gave their life to Christ. And so James refers to his audience as brothers from the same nation, but also as brothers in the Lord, as he'll say, brethren. And James will write to encourage these Jewish Christians in their faith as they're being persecuted for having faith in Jesus. And so if you're dealing with any kind of persecution for your relationship with the Lord, then know this today, this book is for you. And also, as he writes to the Jews that are scattered or to the dispersion, it also carries this idea of scattering seed, interestingly enough. See, historically, excuse me, historically it's fascinating that as the Jewish believers were scattered during the first wave of persecution against the church, they began spreading the gospel everywhere everywhere. So what was centralized started to branch off. And the more that they were persecuted, the more the gospel spread. And so you had a church that started in this little city, and then they would get persecuted. And then part of those people group would go, and they would spread to another city to flee the persecution and plant another church. And then people would get saved, and they'd get persecuted, and then it would spread somewhere else. And next thing you know, this plan of Satan to persecute the church has backfired completely as it just spread. But the Jewish Christians, they often found themselves in a catch-22 in that being a Jew, they would be persecuted by the Gentiles, and being a Jewish Christian, they would be persecuted by the Jews. However, the Lord would use persecution to have the church expand and to be strengthened far and wide. And when you're going through difficulties today, follower of Jesus, you, Know that your faith is going to be strengthened. Through persecution, you will find the gospel will spread. 
You will find that through the attacks of the devil to discourage you, that you will see the Holy Spirit expand its reach. So if you're going through trials, you're not going to want to miss one of these studies. So don't do it, because I'll remember who's out here. (laughs) And we'll be encouraged not only to profess our faith, but to live it out courageously. And there were an array of issues that were plaguing the church that are very commonly plaguing the church today. And we'll see how we can move past those things as we grow in spiritual maturity. In James chapter one, look at verse four. It says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Look at verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Jump down to verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so we'll be covering the connection between patience and the power of the Holy Spirit. And though this is an introduction to James chapter one, this series will be entitled Waiting for Patience. And we'll see how that plays out in the weeks ahead. Because we have to wait for patience to have its perfect work carried out in our lives. We'll also cover the connection between works and faith. And this is a huge issue. In James 2.18 it says, but someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so if you've ever wondered about the intersection of faith and works, you will receive a very clear definition, a very clear teaching on that subject. And so as we come in for a landing now, as we conclude our service before communion, I would ask you in all seriousness, to examine yourself in light of what God's word says. Do not use the person next to you as the measurement for which you decide or determine your standing before God. It is not a comparison and it is not a competition. See, if God is the master builder and he has the master plan, He will give you the exact measurements for everything that you need to be everything that you're supposed to be. And that's why we look to God's word. That's why we receive from him. And so I would ask you to evaluate your own life personally. Don't just play church. Don't just go through the motions. Don't just speak Christianese better than you did last week. I'm asking you to honestly evaluate your life. Number one, are you born again? If you don't know what that is, you need to. Some will say today, true story, in church, I am a Christian, but I'm not one of those born agains. To which I would probably reply, uh, I mean, do you even know what that means? Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter three. He was a religious leader of the Jews. He asked Jesus what he must do, and he said, Jesus replied, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, like anybody else, would be like, because this was the etymology, I guess you could say, of that phrase, born again. Can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? You can just see Jesus, like maybe roll his eye a little bit, like, seriously? But Jesus explained, and he said, you must be born again means to be made alive spiritually. You are born in a physical body, but dead in your sins, with your sinful nature in control of your life. To be born again means to be made alive spiritually. So if you're to say that you are a follower of Jesus, but not one of those born agains, you are saying, I say I follow Jesus, but I'm not made alive spiritually by having faith in him. And the only thing that makes you born again, which you want to be and which we should be, is your personal faith in Jesus. 
You cannot be a follower of Jesus until you've been made alive spiritually. You cannot be made alive spiritually until you've put your faith in him. That's number one. Then secondly, how does your worldview stack up against the Bible's view on the world? How I view the world is going to determine how I live and respond and interact with the world. Am I viewing the world through the world's definition of what life and happiness and fulfillment and right and wrong is? Or am I viewing the world through what's called a biblical worldview? Meaning that I view life through the lens of the scripture, that what God says is right, what God says is wrong, what God says brings fulfillment, what God says brings happiness, what God says brings everything that I'm supposed to have is what I believe. So my view is a biblical worldview. Thirdly, how does your lifestyle of action now stand up against the word of God? So I profess that I believe that this is true. I profess that I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I profess that God's word is God's word. Then now I have to look at my life. How does my life stand up against what God's word says my life should be? And then you're able to determine, are you where you should be? Or are you compromised? Or are you what the Bible calls a carnal Christian, which is seemingly oxymoronic in that it means being a worldly Christian? How can I be a worldly follower of Jesus? So am I hearing and am I doing? And then fourthly and finally, are you prepared to handle difficulties, trials, and testings of your faith in such a manner that it glorifies, in such a way that it glorifies God and opens a massive bandwidth for the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you. That's what this letter is all about. Spiritual maturity. To grow past the basic elements to be able to take now those truth of God, truths of God's word and then apply them. So I'm going to take these things, I'm going to own them for myself, and then when I'm living this out in real life, I am using them so that I might live a life to be pleasing to the Lord. And these are great things for all of us, myself included, to be praying over as we study this exciting book of James. And so again, in verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And that's where we end today, and that's where we will pick up next Sunday as we look at having patience, as we look at waiting for patience, to have its perfect work so that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us, for your faithfulness to us even when we're faithless. You remain faithful. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, I ask that for our church as we step into this new season, I pray, Lord, that you would help us in our own hearts, in our own lives, to be men and women that glorify you in everything that we do. I pray that it wouldn't just be the case where we grow old without growing up. I pray, Lord, that we would see very clearly your direction so that we might walk victoriously, walk obediently, and realize every everything that you have ordained for us, Lord, is the best that we could ever ask for. And so, Lord, I pray that even right now, if there are some of your sons and daughters that are seated here or watching from some other place that have felt convicted, even before we've done a deep dive into the main section of James, Lord, maybe they're already feeling convicted now. 
I pray, Lord, that they would confess any unconfessed sin. If even something as simple as how does your life stack up against God's word? Are you hearing it or are you doing it as well? Lord, even something as simple as that, your spirit's moving and I ask, Lord, that the seed of the truth of your word would fall on good ground. Because as it gets scattered out here today, it could fall along the wayside or fall amongst the thorns. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches can choke those things out, can impede its progress, can stunt the growth. I ask, Lord, that all of us would have hearts that could be identified as being good soil. And then it brings forth lots and lots of good fruit. And with every eye closed and head bowed, I'm gonna invite the men that are gonna be distributing communion to make their way to the front. But for you, church, just with your eyes closed and your head bowed, before we observe communion today, if you're here and you have never been born again, maybe you thought, well, I believed in God, you know, or I know of God, but you've never had what Jesus told Nicodemus about, that you must be born again. This comes through placing your faith in Jesus and he takes what is dead spiritually and makes it alive. And so with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here and you've never been born again and you would like to be, would you just raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. Anybody else, just hold your hand up. I see you over there too. God bless you. Anybody else, just hold your hand up. I'm gonna pray for you right now. Father, I pray for these that have raised their hands. I ask that you would meet them exactly where they're at. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And with every eye closed and head bowed, for those of you that raised your hand, I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer of faith. And even, if, even if you didn't raise your hand, and you know in your heart, like, I want this, but I don't know if I feel comfortable raising my hand. Listen, raising your hand doesn't save you. Faith in Jesus does. And I'm gonna ask that you would repeat this prayer after me and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned. But I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sin. I thank you that you have made me alive spiritually today. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace? And would you give me your strength that I might be who you've created me to be? For I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for those that have prayed that prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing here. And as we remember the greatest gift given this world, may we participate in communion with thankful hearts, with expectancy for your sudden return. And I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.